Wow, God's love and mercy in the cross. So I did prepare correctly for this. Uh, sometimes I was I gave a talk to the sisters, of, uh, the Benedictine sisters of St. Walburga, and Mother and Mother Mary Michael, she's like, oh, could you talk about the call and discernment because you're a vocation director? I'm like, yeah, sure. And she asked me like four months before the talk. And then I was praying about it, and God's like, no, nah, you need to talk about vulnerability and the sacred heart of Jesus. So I get there, and I talk about vulnerability, and Mother's like, well, that's not what I was expecting, but it was great. So, so I got this one. We got this one on track. This is also a one that's a little more serious. I know there's a little gravitas to this talk. Um, usually when you think of Father Ryan, I don't know if you know me, but when you think of Father Ryan, you don't think of gravitas. Uh, usually you think of, like, zany. Um, but... The talk today is about the cross, and the cross is never easy. Okay, so that's why there's a bit of a, a gravitas. Like, I'm not going to make it harder than it normally, normally is, but it's just a difficult subject. So before I continue... Start with the sign of the cross, the symbol of our faith. I, I can tell... I mean, I can tell, what am I saying? I know, as a priest, as a brother, as a father, that all of us in this room have suffered in some way, shape, or form. And my hope is that by talking about the cross and the price of the cross tonight, that it will bring you some comfort to understand God's love and his mercy through the cross. And not just the picture of the cross, and not just that crucifix on the wall, and not that crucifix, but the actual suffering in your life. That's what I'm talking about. When I talk about the cross, I'm talking about the actual pain, the actual sorrow, the actual disappointments, rejections, failures, problems, issues, whatever it is in your life. And, and, and when I talk about the cross, it comforts me. So I like talking about it because it reminds me that God is working through the pain and the sorrow in my life when I forget that so easily. So my goal is not to torture you tonight. My goal is to comfort you, although it is a difficult subject. So I'm going to start off by just laying out some of my credentials here um, when it comes to talking about the cross. Because you're like, what is this guy going to say? 34 years old, what a pansy. He's, not, he's never suffered. So I'll just go through some of the things in my life that I have prayed through and thought about. And God has said, this is a cross that I've given you, Father Ryan. So first of all, when I was about three or four, I lived in Fort Collins. And my parents had a 35-gallon fish tank on a wire stand, and I was sitting on the shelf below the, on the wire stand, and I was uh, we're playing with a scratch and sniff puzzle. I'll never forget it. And those cherries smelled amazing. I was smelling those cherries. And I was about three years old, and I stood up, and I grabbed the wire frame, and as I was walking away, it was an empty tank. It's important. Empty fish tank. As I was walking away, it fell over behind me right on top of my head and just like basically cut up my whole head when I was like, one of my first memories is being like crushed by a fish tank. So um, it's a good way to start life, right? Yeah. So then uh, then as I grew up, uh, started, my brother and I, uh, we were really good, close friends, really loved each other. He's only 18 months younger than I am. So we're very close in age and we were like our best friends, you know? Um, and so then as we grew up, we started to go di different ways, like especially in high school. And that was, that's always been suffering for me. That me and my brother, uh, he, he doesn't practice his faith the same way I do. Um, it's just, we've just had some disagreements, some arguments uh, at pretty profound levels in my life. So one of the people in my life who was the closest, that I love the most, I just have a hard time relating to. It's getting better now, but I'm just sharing with you the, my, some of my crosses here. Um, also, this is going to seem kind of shallow, but my dad was an amazing football player in high school, but not me. Like, I played football for two years, and I never started, and our team only won one game in two years. So uh, that was a big failure for me, and that, like, really kind of was a blow at my masculinity, because I identified football with manhood, you know? And so that's false, obviously, but that was always kind of a struggle for me. Like, I'm not a real man, I can't play football, uh, so that was a struggle for me. Also, then going into college, uh, this may surprise you, but I had girlfriends, and I broke up with them. So that was also another heartbreak. <laughs> Uh, that I can relate to, uh, to a certain degree, uh, with those of you in this room who have gone through the similar experience. Then after becoming a priest, my grandmother died. My grandmother died, l like, literally two months after I was ordained a priest. Um, and so that was really hard. And that was the first person in my life that was really close to me that I lost. And I did her funeral, which I think was a bit of a mistake on my part, but I did it anyway, whatever. I was just, like, totally out of it. I didn't really pray very well. I mean, I don't even remember what I preached about, but it was, it was okay enough, I guess. Uh, and then uh, another thing, 
when I was about 25, I got diagnosed with osteoarthritis in my neck. So I have like, it feels like there's a nail in my neck every once in a while. You know what it's like for those of you who have arthritis. So yeah, at 25 years old, I got a nail in my neck and the doctors aren't sure why, besides I'm just stressed out and my neck was crooked for like 25 years. So uh, that's another thing that I, I continue to struggle with every day is that pain in my neck. Uh, and then for those of you who know me really well, uh, last February 8th, I suffered a severe concussion. They call it TBI, traumatic brain injury. Basically, the whole back half of my brain was bruised, uh, and I'm basically going to be telling you little bits and pieces of that story uh, throughout the evening tonight, which is what started my love for the cross. It wasn't until that concussion that I really understood God's love through the cross. I have had crosses, but I've never had a cross like that. So I was playing basketball, and I don't remember it. I don't remember what happened, so I had amnesia around the experience. I was intercepting the ball, they tell me, and I fell backwards, and the ball was in my hand. I landed on my bottom, and I whiplashed my head back to the ground, and it split open the back of my head. I had five staples in the back of my head. I was bleeding all over the floor, which I think is kind of cool. But so, but they said, but they said it was immediate trauma, a shock to my nervous system, and my arms and legs went straight out like this. They said I was like a dead possum, which is like really sad thought. You know, I was unconscious for about a minute. Then they brought in the stretcher board and they called the ambulance and they took me out. They put in the staples. They recorded me on my phone in the hospital and they said, Father Ryan, you know where you're at? And I'm like, no, I have no idea where I'm at. I said, but it feels like I'm not wearing any pants because I have one of those little pants <laughs> on it. It's on the video. I don't remember it though. And they said, what year is it, Father Ryan? I was like, it's gotta be after 2002 because I graduated in 2002, but I have no idea where it is. They're like, who's the president? I'm like, I don't know. The last one I can remember is George Bush. <laughs> so it was really bad, really bad. I had memory that worked for five seconds, and that lasted for three days. So for three days, my memory only worked for five seconds. And my mom and dad took me home, and my dad would sit in the room with me and be like, and I would, he'd just be listening to me, and I'd just be talking. And I don't remember this, but he said, I would say, Dad, because the Super Bowl was the weekend before. I said, Dad, who won the Super Bowl? He's like, the Patriots. I was like, great. Hey, Dad, who won the Super Bowl? The Patriots. And so it was like one of those things, and then my dad just left the room because he couldn't stand it. And then on Friday, so this happened on Wednesday, on Friday I woke up, and I was looking, and my mom was waking me up in my bed from when I grew up as a child, and I'm like, what am I doing at home with Mom and Dad? Like, all I remember was being at my job, downtown Denver, and now I wake up, and I don't even know where I'm at, and I'm like, ow. So it was, a, it was just a, a big shock to the system. It was it's the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I had to cancel all of my life for four months. For four months, I couldn't do anything. I had to wear sunglasses all the time because all light, all light caused me headaches. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't look at my cell phone. I couldn't check my email. I couldn't, I could, the only thing I could do was listen to people and talk to people, and even that wore me out. Um, my, I lost my balance, so I had to go back to therapy. My inner ear was disconnected from my brain, so I couldn't balance on my own, so I had to go back to therapy for three months to do that. Um, it was just the worst thing, and I had migraines every day. Uh, migraine he headaches, for those of you who have migraines, been there. Um, I've had, I had migraines all day, every day, for the first three months, and then after that, they started spreading out every two weeks, every three weeks, every, every month or so, and now I don't have any more migraines, so that was just a side effect of, of that. I had insomnia, I couldn't sleep uh, for like days in a row. I wouldn't be able to sleep, and so I'd just be laying there awake and just in pain. So I just wanted to share this with you because this is kind of what kicked off my love and my desire to share this talk with you. And uh, and just so you know that I have an idea and, and of what the cross is, and I and I want you to know that I've suffered, and I want my suffering to be part of you. I want to share that with you as as a compassionate brother, as an experience. Um, I'm not sitting up here saying I'm better than you. I just want you to know this is I'm speaking from experience. Okay, so enough of the background. Let's get into the theology. Let's start off with the very first lesson. This, cruci this cross is a very bad cross. Why is it a bad cross? Not because it's crooked, not because it's black, because there's no Jesus. There's no Jesus with that. There's a Jesus on that cross, there's Jesus on that cross, Jesus, all these other crosses are great crosses. But never, ever, ever look at the cross, especially in your own life. And that's, that's where it's difficult. Don't look at the cross in your own life without Jesus. Because if you do, it will overwhelm you, and it will crush you. Humanity is too weak. Our humanity cannot do it alone. And the cross is never meant to be given to you without the Lord Jesus. Jesus never gives you a cross without giving himself. He always comes with it. It's a two-for-one deal is what I call it. 
If he gives you suffering and pain, he also gives you himself. You may not see him, you may not feel him, you may not hear him, but he is there. I promise you. He is there. He promises that. He promises that he will be with us until the end of the age. And so do not look at the cross in your life without <laughs> Jesus. If you are going through a problem, a struggle, a pain right now, stop, stop you know, focusing in on it and saying, what a problem this is. Bring back your focus a little bit and say, Jesus, where are you in this? Jesus, I need to see you. Jesus, I need to feel you. Jesus, I want to experience you with this cross. Because if you don't, it's just darkness. It's just death. That's all it is. And our humanity can't support that. And that's not God's will. God's will is not that you focus on just the evil, not just the cross, but Jesus with the cross. When Jesus comes with the cross, there's no need to fear. The cross is really scary. Traumatic brain injury is really scary. Like, I could have been paralyzed. I could have, all these bad things could have happened. My eyes, I actually got new glasses and everything from that, too. Changed, it changed my eyes permanently. It, these things that happen to us can be deadly to our humanity. And that's why it's important. If Jesus is there, we don't have to be afraid. And sometimes Jesus might just be asking you to make an act of faith. You may not be able to sense Jesus. You might say, Jesus, where are you? Show me yourself. And Jesus might be saying, I want you just to trust me here. And that's where your faith has to come in and say, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. I can't see you. I can't hear you. I can't feel you. But I believe that you're here some way, shape, or form. Because Father Ryan said so. And if he's wrong, then we're all going to hell. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Do not be afraid. So that's why I say, you don't have to be afraid. Think about the cross in your life right now. It might be a habitual sin. It might be a difficult relationship. It might be you just got fired from a job. It might be one of your children who doesn't practice the Catholic faith. It might be whatever, whatever it is. Just make an act of faith and say, Jesus, I believe that you're with this cross. And I don't have to be afraid of it. I don't have to be afraid. That's so freeing. We can let go of our fear. And like I said, whenever we get a cross, Jesus comes with it. And what is that? What is the gift of self? The gift of self is love. Whenever you give yourself to somebody, whether it's in words or a gift or whether it's, you know, giving them a hug or a handshake, that's an act of love. And when Jesus gives you a cross, I'm about to spoil the whole talk. When Jesus gives you a cross, it's always an act of love. If you don't remember anything tonight, that's all you need to remember. Whenever you experience the cross, it is always an act of love from God's part. You may not experience it that way. Because you're weak, you're blind, your, your intellect is not very good when it comes to spiritual things. You've had a lot of bad experiences in your life. I'm telling you, every bad experience you've ever had from God's side is always to show you how much he loves you. Just super counterintuitive, which is why I love this talk. <coughs> With the Lord, you do not need to fear the cross ever because it's never about what you think it's about. What your humanity tells you, suffering, death, pain, rejection, fear, loneliness, isolation, all of that, it's not about that. Now that's a part of it. You're telling me, I, I laid on my bed of pain for four months with nobody except my sunglasses like Ray Charles, you know what I mean? And, and all I had to think about was the pain, the loneliness, the rejection, the darkness, and that's all I had. And sometimes it's easy to, to just re to think that's what it's all about, but I'm telling you, it's not. And I'm asking you to use your eyes of faith to look at that cross with Jesus, to look at that cross in your life, whatever it is, with eyes of faith and say, Jesus, I trust you. We don't need to ask for crosses. Please don't ask for crosses, right? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes when, maybe it's only for young people, okay? <laughs> so if you're a young person, you're like, yeah, I want to be holy, give me a cross. No, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> we all know that crosses will come. So I'm just reminding you of what you already know. So just in case you get really zealous someday, and you're like, yeah, no. Don't ask for crosses. There's no need to ask for the cross. And you don't need to look for the cross either. <coughs> Sometimes I think overly pious people will be like, where's the cross? I need to find the cross. That way I can, I can be holy. Where is it? Where's the cross in my life? Where's the suffering? Right? Don't do that either. What we need to do is remain a child, a child in that childlike position and say, I'm just going through life, and whatever comes to me, I will accept with open arms. I will accept good, bad, and ugly with open arms, Jesus. It's not what I want, it's not what I expected, but it's what you've given me. <coughs> and I trust you, and I will accept that, okay? So no need to ask for the cross, no need to look for it. It will come to you, and guess what? You won't miss it, right? You won't miss it. 
It's not like you're going to be like, is this the cross? Am I suffering now? No. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the situation here. And if that is the situation, then it's probably not the cross, okay? <laughs> As you all know, crosses will not be lacking because of sin and the devil, <coughs> right? Because of sin and the devil, God has given us freedom to suffer. But we don't suffer alone. Remember, God himself became man to suffer with us. And the heaviest cross in the history of the world was borne by Jesus Christ. That is very important. The heaviest cross in the history of the world was borne by Jesus Christ. I don't care how heavy you think your cross is, you ain't got nothing on the Son of God. You might say, Father Ryan, it's so hard and I can't do this. Okay, okay, I respect that. I'm compassionate. I have TBI. But I want to keep it in perspective. The weight that you're bearing is not the heaviest cross in the world. And you can share that with Jesus knowing that he is the superman. That the cross that you're carrying is a piece of cake for him. That's why I share that with you. Not to make you feel bad, because your cross is heavy. For you, it is heavy. I get that. But I want you to realize that his cross was way heavier, and he can take that off your shoulders whenever he dang well pleases. Because his biceps are huge. He can do it. He's got the power. So I want you to believe in that. Believe that he has the power to relieve you of that burden whenever he wants. Because he is the man. <clears throat> so, there's three ways that I think we, as human beings and Catholic Christians, look at the cross. So I'm going to go through the three different ways we look at the cross. I'll write these down, whatever. <laughs> and I still want to start by saying all three of these ways are actually valid. None of these ways is necessarily wrong, but they are ascendingly better than the others. They ascend in, in goodness and quality, uh, depth and purity and goodness, okay? So the first one is punishment. That's the first thing I thought of when I woke up. Well, that's not quite true. It's about the second thing I thought of. It's one of the main things that I thought of when I woke up with my concussion. I started going through the list of things that I had done wrong. Because it was, it was awful. I, I just became vocation director, and I had to cancel four months of my life. And I, I, I barely even been vocation director. Um, so I was going through the list of things that I had done wrong to deserve the cross, this punishment, right? And it's very, very natural for our sinful humanity, our sinfulness, because we're, we're sinners, to, to lean towards this and say like, oh yeah, of course. If only I hadn't done A, B, or C when I was, you know, in my 20s. Or if only I hadn't have said that to my boss the other day when I was in a bad mood. Maybe I wouldn't be suffering this way. We think that. We think that we deserve to suffer for our sins. Because in the limited scope of this world, that makes sense with justice. Because we like justice. And when we see something bad happening, we think something bad should happen to us. You know, it's another, another word for that is karma. Karma is a similar idea, right? And there is examples of this in, in the Bible. Bad things happen to bad people in the Bible. You mess with the Israelites, God's going to blow you up, right? If you do bad things to his people, he's going to get vengeance. So it's not like this isn't even in the Bible. This is actually in the Bible. What I'm saying is this is, this is where you need to begin and grow, okay? So acknowledge, acknowledge the fact that you feel this. Okay, yeah, Jesus, I, I might be suffering for, for my sins. And the Bible also says that God chastises every son that he loves. That's in the book of Hebrews. God chastises every son that he loves. But you see that word love sneaking in there again. He's not chastising you just because you deserve it. He's chastising you because he loves you. And I think we forget that accent. We forget that accent of love. And we focus on just the punishment. Right? And we just focus on just the pain. Um, this is also the foundation of the Jansenist heresy. So let's just say this was your bread and butter when it comes to your spiritual life. All you cared about was punishment and how much you deserved your punishment. Welcome to Jansenism. 
That's what a Jansenist Catholic believes. I deserve to be punished because I am a sinner, and therefore I can never receive communion because I'll never be worthy enough because I know that I sinned right before I went to communion by thinking about that guy in the pew right next to me negatively. And so I don't deserve to ever receive communion because I can never do anything right, and I always deserve to be punished. Right? And, and, and the other thought that's behind that, on a psychological level, is the thought that says, I'm no good. I'm no good. I'm a piece of trash. I'm dirty. I am unworthy. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve God's love. All of those thoughts are false. And all of those thoughts are the, the, the pit hole of this first view of the cross. It's very hard to get out of that pit hole. If you're thinking those thoughts, you need to begin to acknowledge that and let those thoughts go because they're just not true. God chastises us out of love. He doesn't punish us out of anger. Okay? So that, that's the seed of truth. He does chastise us out of love, but not out of anger. And I just want to bring up that Old Testament example again. Right? Go back to the Old Testament. There's examples of leprosy. Oh, you're a leper? Ooh, what'd you do wrong? You got leprosy. You must have done something wrong. You're poor? Well, you don't have any land? Uh-oh. What did your ancestors do wrong? Huh? What did you do wrong? Why Why don't you have a house? Why don't you have a wife or kids or money? Right? Uh-oh. And they stay away. The Jews, would, they, the Jews and the Old Testament Israelites, they would shun their own people. And then the other one that, that always gets me, because I have friends who struggle with this, is infertility. Infertility. Oh, you can't have a baby? Mmm. Ooh. Don't go near her. She's cursed. She's being punished because she can't. Because she must have done something wrong because she can't have a baby. Right? So the Old Testament does kind of perpetuate this in some ways. And so it's important that we don't live in the Old Testament. You are not Old Testament people. You are New Testament people in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. So now go to the New Testament. Jesus takes that and flips it on his head. Right? In, in the Gospel of John, there's a man born blind. And the apostles, they go up and say, Jesus, who sinned? Is his parents or him? Why is he blind? Who sinned? Who deserves to be punished? Why is he being punished? What does Jesus say? No one. This is for the glory of God. I haven't heard like more beautiful words in my life. Because that is Jesus saying, Ryan, you might be blind, but it's not because I'm punishing you. It's so that my glory may be manifested in you, in your blindness. Oh my gosh! God's glory can be manifested in my blindness. I don't even have to be good at football. I can be blind. I can be blind, and his glory will be manifested. It's like, it's like walking backwards and winning the race. <laughs> it's awesome. You know what I mean? It's so awesome that Jesus flips the entire thing on its head. And God says to us through Jesus, I've been trying to say this to you all along, but because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses gave you a second law. Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is what perpetuated the poverty and the leprosy and the infertility lies, right? Jesus is saying, no, I have come to bring you back to the first law. The first law is that God may chastise you, but only out of love. And that your chastisement and your suffering is for his glory, not to make you feel bad or to punish you necessarily. And not because you're a sinner. And I bet that guy was a sinner, the blind guy. And I bet his parents were sinners. But notice how Jesus doesn't even mess with that. Jesus is like, you gotta be kidding me. You think sin's an issue for me? Do you know who I am? I am God. Nothing can taint me. Nothing can harm me. Nothing can make me unclean. He's God. And that's why he didn't even mess with the sin question. He said, forget about that, guys. It's for my glory. It's for the glory of God. That's what it's all about. And Cardinal Stafford would... Cardinal Stafford. I live with Cardinal Stafford. He would really appreciate it if I threw this in there for you. The glory of God eventually needs to be the only motivation for all that we do in our life. Eventually. It may not be the motivation you're doing what you're doing right now. Your career might be the motivation. Your health might be the motivation. Your relationship might be the motivation. But eventually, that career, your health, and that relationship are going to be purified by the cross 
so that your motives will be purified solely for his honor and his glory. So that no matter what cross comes, you can say, it's not about my career anymore, Jesus. Not about my relationship anymore, Jesus. Not about my health anymore, Jesus. That's amazing. When you can say that, it's not about my health anymore, Jesus. It's about your honor and your glory being manifested in me. Check out Blessed Chiara Badano for that one. Amazing. This is why the saints say, I love to suffer. Bring it on. That's what they say. I love to suffer. You ever heard the saints? I hate it when they say that. I'm like, you're kidding me. I hate suffering. How am I ever going to be a saint? It's, this is how they do it. They say, because my suffering is for the honor and glory of God, and that makes me happy. But their motives have been purified by what? By the cross. They didn't force themselves to want that. They didn't say, I just got to be good enough and I'll want it. No. They suffered. And through their suffering, they experienced God's love. And then they realized, ah, suffering is actually really fun when you experience God's love through it. Yeah, lying on my bed of pain during my concussion, examining my conscience, saying, this is why I had a concussion, because of all my sins, right? Okay, number two. I kind, of had, I kind of had a hard time deciding what to call number two, but those three words all kind of are related. Expiation, purification, and testing, okay? So God is going to use suffering in your life, as most of you already know, uh, to test you. To test your love for him. And I already mentioned this. I just, I just I keep blowing this talk beforehand. I already talked about it just now. God will purify your motives. Purification. He will purify you through suffering. Through suffering, it's really important that we understand that this is another aspect of the cross. That Jesus will lay the cross on you, not out of anger, not out of, you know, whatever, negligence, or anything like that. He'll lay the cross on you to say, do you love me for me, or do you love me for the good feelings I give you? Right? We've all heard this before. St. Teresa of Avila says, don't desire the good things God gives you, but desire the God of good things. Right? And so whatever suffering you're going through, that could be another reason that God is laying this on you. Because is it really true love if it's not tested? No, it's not really true love if it's tested. If it's untested, it's not true love. True love is when a husband walks with his wife through breast, breast cancer. True love is when a wife bears with her husband through a period of unemployment. True love is tested when mom and dad lose one of their children. That's true love. But how many couples are broken by those experiences? Because they don't have true love. Jesus doesn't want to be the flaky husband. Jesus doesn't want us to be the flaky wife who comes and goes only when things feel good. True love requires testing. You all know it. And those are the relationships you admire the most in your life, are the people who have suffered and continue to love. And that's what Jesus wants of you. And so you can, you can run. You all know this. You can run. You come up to something. You're like, I like this. I'm doing God's will. It's difficult. I'm out of here. <laughs> Okay, let's go over here. Doing God's will over here. This is great. I like it. Oh, get in the heart. I'm out of here. Let's try this over here. God's will might be over here. Yep. Oh, get in the heart. I'm going out of here. Where am I going? Oh, 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 oh. It's going to get you. He's going to get you. He is going to get you. You cannot run. There is no place you can go and not find this. Why? Because he's insanely in love with you and he wants to purify your love. He wants your love to be as pure as his love. If you really want to follow him, then that means you're saying, I want to be like you, Jesus. And if you say that, then he's like, really? Okay, great. Here's the cross, you know? And I think we don't think about that enough. As disciples, 
I hear a lot about discipleship. Oh my gosh, our diocese loves discipleship, right? We love it, and I love it. I'm not against it at all, but I rarely hear about cruciform discipleship. I rarely hear about cruciform discipleship. And I think discipleship can so easily just become a social experience. Just a social experience. And St. Paul always talks about that. Cruciform. Cruciform. You're not a true disciple until you're cruciform. Until you are in the form of the cross. This is the shape of a true disciple. And Jesus even said it. St. Paul didn't make it up. Jesus said, "Take, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That's what discipleship is. And I think as, as long as our discipleship programs are just education, formation, it's never going to take us to the next level. Our, our discipleship programs have to become cruciform, which means we need people who know how to suffer, walking with people who are suffering. We need people who have borne the cross in their life, and they said, I believe and I know the power of God's love through the cross. Let me walk with you through your cancer. Let me walk with you through your breakup with your boyfriend. Let me walk with you through A, B, C, or D. That's where, that's where our discipleship will come. You'll make it to the next level. Because then, ah, I'm just going to ruin my whole talk. Because then no matter what happens, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Okay, back to number two. Whew, purification test, okay. <laughs> the cross gives us an occasion to prove our love to Jesus. The cross gives us an occasion to prove that we love him. Like I said, you can, you can either turn around and walk away, or you can say, okay, Jesus, you want to throw down? I'm going to throw down too. I'm not giving up. We're going to do this. To prove your love for him. The other thing suffering helps us do is to detach ourselves from earth to remember heaven. And that's exactly what happened during my concussion. I was so focused on being a good vocation director, learning how to answer those phone calls, learning how to respond to those emails, learning how to meet with guys who are interested in the priesthood, learning how to work with seminarians, learning how to relate to my secretary, learning how to talk to the archbishop, learning how to live with the archbishop, learning all these things that are very, very earthly. Not bad. God's will, but very, very earthly. I bought a new car because I finally had enough money to buy a new car, right? So all these things, very, very earthly. And then I hit my head. And all of a sudden, my new car. I didn't drive my new car for four months. It smelled brand new like a year later. It was awesome. But I didn't drive my car for four months, my brand new car. I was like, no, let go. Let go of the car, Father Ryan. Not for you need to start thinking about me in heaven. Let go of your secretary, let go of all those emails, all those stupid screens you want to look at, stop. No, no, no football, nothing, none of that. Can't look at any of that, stop. No, no emails, none of that. Just got to think about me or your pain. That's all you get, Father Ryan. You can't even read Mass. I couldn't even read Mass. I can only can celebrate Mass with people. I couldn't, I couldn't read for myself. So God even took the Mass away from me. Why? Because it's like, you don't even need the Mass. I'm right here. I'm God. <laughs> I mean, that's how extreme he is. Sufferings help us to detach ourselves, and that suffering of my concussion did it very literally. And all I could do was lay on my bed and pray, or cry, or do nothing. Um, the, other, the, other, the other place that I see this very strongly is that we have seminarians who go to Puebla, Mexico, every year. They go to Puebla. And in Puebla, they study Spanish for two months. And I just noticed that the quality of life in Puebla is uh, a little lower than it is here. It just is. The pollution that comes out of those cars is disgusting. You can't drink the water. May I repeat, you cannot drink the water. <laughs> the place we were staying, the shower heads didn't work. When you turn them on, they'd literally fall off on you. You couldn't flush anything down the toilet because the sewer systems don't work. You know, and you can't eat any food off of the street or you might get diarrhea. Right? And so, and so they're just the quality of life. And the houses are so tiny, so small. We visit these families. Literally, you get like three rooms for a family of eight people. Three rooms for eight people? Like, I'm talking three rooms. Kitchen, dining room, living room. That's it. And they sleep in the living room. Quality of living is a lot lower. But guess what? They suffer a lot more than we do. And guess what? They believe in God way more than we do. 
They believe in God way more than we do. Every family we visited, every seminary we talked to, I'd be like, dang, this dude's got more faith than like I've ever had in my entire life. And it's pinky, you know what I mean? Like, they just trust, they love, and they know this, they understand this. Puebla has the most Catholic churches than any other diocese in the world. They have 365 Catholic churches in their diocese. One for each day of the year. They did that on purpose. Because every day was dedicated to God, and each church has its own day. Talk about faith. Can you believe 365 churches in Denver? That'd be awesome. You know what I mean? Okay, everybody, I hope you don't mind squeezing into those three room houses. Here we go. <laughs> so, what do you want? You want comfort, or do you want faith? A lot of times they don't go together. That's why what I'm saying to you tonight isn't easy to say. And it's not fun to think about or talk about. But it is important. Another thing, too, a great cross along the lines of testing, purification, expiation is usually a prelude to a great grace. If you have a huge cross in your life right now, like I did with my concussion, you got something really bad, you can't solve it, you can't figure it out, you don't know where it's going to end, guess what? You are in ripening stages for a very great grace. I like to think of grapes on a vine. Can you imagine being a grape on a vine? You think you're a little grape, you're like, I'm doing fine, man. It's like, oh, why, why am I going to grow? Ow! Oh, oh! And you're like expanding, you know what I mean? Like, ow, dang, it hurts, I don't want to expand. And then when you get fat enough... <laughs> When you get full enough, they rip you off the vine. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. And they're like, dang right, you're going to die. You're a grape. And then they throw you in a bath, and they smash you. They crush you. And then all your guts fly out, and it goes into some container. And they either turn you into welches, or they let you sit on the shelf for years. <laughs> suffering in a dark basement. Until someone pops the cork, and they pour you out at a wedding banquet. At a wedding banquet. Or at a mass. And your wine blood becomes the blood of God. You see that great grace that that grape is being prepared for? And does he know it? No, all he wants to do is stay on the vine and remain green and small. He doesn't want to turn purple and get big and blow up. No, he doesn't want to do that. But that's what God's doing to you. You may not want that, but guess what? That's what you're created to do. You're created to give glory to God. And through that suffering, he's ripening you. So the more you desire to give glory to God, the easier it will be to go along with what's going on in your life. All right. Let's go on to... Actually, I'm going to share one more thing. So I was uh, sitting at home alone a lot when I was concussed. <laughs> and uh, the bishop has a very nice house. I live there, and he's got a giant painting the size of this whiteboard of the Last Supper. I don't know who painted it, but it's not Leonardo da Vinci's. It's, it's a different one. And it's got the typical, everybody get on the side of the table, smile, you know, that kind of thing. So all the guys are on that side of the table. There's a cat over here. There's a dog over here. And there's like a wall behind them. And the wall stops, and you can see this outside, outdoor scenery. There's like trees and birds and hawks and doves. And then right above Jesus' head, so Jesus is in the middle doing his thing, and above his head, along that wall in the painting, there's wording in Latin. And I, I, sat, and I sat in front of that painting for months, totally healthy, totally, you know, doing my own thing, and it wasn't until I got the traumatic brain injury that I started looking at that painting more, because I was bored and lonely. <laughs> and I, I looked at that re the writing on the wall, and lucky for you, I speak Latin. So I translated that, and it's, it's a quote from the Bible. And Jesus says the, this. He said it to me when I was sitting there with my Ray Charles sunglasses on, by myself, sad and alone. He said this to me. You are those who have continued with me in my trials. As my Father appointed a kingdom for me, so do I appoint for you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And when I translated that, I looked at it and I was like, oh my God. It, the light shone in to the whole concussion thing. And I said, I am one of those 
who has continued with him in his trials. And Jesus says that to you in your pain. Jesus says that to you in your loneliness. You are the ones who have continued with me in my trials. And guess what? I am going to give you a kingdom. And you're going to sit on a throne with me. Because, why? You're really good at football, or you're really good at sports, you're really good at math and science, you're a really good mom, you're a really good dad. No! That's not why you're going to sit on a throne. You're going to sit on a throne because you suffered with him through his trials. That's why. That's why he's going to give you a kingdom. Because of the cross you bore. Man, I love the cross. Number three. This one is the best one. Number three. Three ways to look at the cross. You can look at your cross and say, oh, what was me? I'm being punished. Partially true. Oh, number two, you can say, oh my gosh, God's testing me. Wow, I really hope I pass this test good. Yeah, that's partially true. Number three. Number three is always true in every case. Always, 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 always true. And I have to repeat that so many times because we don't believe it. I don't believe it. I'm trying to convince myself here, too. God always and only gives us this, the cross because he loves us. Rarely, rarely do I see a Christian act this way. Because it's hard. It is so flippant, contradictory to everything we've ever experienced in life according to this world. So contradictory for me to look at the worst traumatic brain injury I've ever had in my life and say, Oh, God loves me! <laughs> it's impossible for me to do that on my own. That's why I love those commercials. You ever see those commercials? I was watching football the other day, and they showed these like really dumb things. Like They're like, are you the kind of person that likes sitting on gum in a chair? And they're like, oh! <laughs> it's like, on their bottom. It's like, like well, are you the kind of person that likes walking into a glass door? It's like, it's like oh! And you've seen those commercials? They're so ridiculous. They're so ridiculous because they're laughing so hard. And this guy's sitting in the car, he's opening a can of pop that's been shaken. He's like, are you the kind of person that likes a shaking uh, open can of pop? And he goes, she's like, <laughs> it's all going all over him. I love those commercials because this is exactly what's going on. In their suffering, they're like, they, they're feeling loved. The can of pop is going all over his face in his car. He's like, oh, I love it. You know, the, the lady's got gum on her butt from sitting on the chair. And she's like, oh, this is amazing. You know, that's what's going on. Now, they may not be thinking of it as Jesus Christ or redemption or salvation or that. But that's a good example of what Jesus is, is leading us to. He's not forcing you to feel that. He's not expecting you to feel that. You don't have to force yourself to feel it. But that's the kind of purification, that's the level he wants to elevate you to. So the next time I get a traumatic brain injury, I'll be like, <laughs> I'm not getting for that. You know what I mean? Why? Because I love being punished? No. Because I love being purified? No. Because I love to be loved. What if in that commercial, those people are experiencing the love of God through gum on their bottom? What if those people are experiencing the love of God through a pop in the face? That, that could happen to you if you believe. The worst thing, and I love this, this is, this is what, I don't know if you, I mean, you know Stephen Colbert. Stephen Colbert, he's got a late night show, he used to be a comedian on Comedy Central or whatever it was. Stephen Colbert lost his dad and his brother in an airplane accident when he was 12 years old. His dad was a pilot, a private pilot, and his brother was learning how to fly with his dad, older brother. And on a trip, they crashed and died. Their plane crashed and they blew up and they died. Stephen Colbert was 12 years old. He was raised Catholic. And he said he loved Lord of the Rings. Stephen Colbert loved Lord of the Rings. He loved it because it was Catholic and he loved it because it was just fun to read. And he said when his dad and his brother died, he said after that, he started reading the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. The letters that J.R.R. Tolkien wrote to his son and his, his admirers and his fans and his family. And in one of those letters, J.R.R. Tolkien said to his son, who was in World War II, I believe, he said, son, you'll know that you've come to the faith when the worst thing that's ever happened to you becomes the best thing that's ever happened to you. And Colbert, Stephen, little 13-year-old Stephen Colbert said that line stuck in his brain and he could never forget it. And he prayed about it, and he prayed about it, and he prayed about it. He said, the death of my dad and my brother is the worst thing that's ever happened to me, God. 
I'm only 12 years old and I don't have a dad. And my best friend is dead, my brother. And through that, through wrestling with that cross, Stephen Colbert said he came to know the love of God for his dad and the love of God for his brother and the love of God for Stephen and his mother. And Stephen said that event is now the greatest event in his entire life because of the love that he experienced through the cross. Because he didn't reject the cross, because he didn't throw it away, because he didn't try to run from it, because he actually went into it and said, J.R.R. Tolkien is probably right, I'm going to figure this out. And I heard that in an interview with Stephen Colbert, and I don't know if I agree with all of his jokes, but that was amazing. <laughs> and how many of you can say the worst thing that's ever happened to me is the best thing that's ever happened to me? Because that is what God wants for you. You can't force yourself to do it, though. All you can do is give God your goodwill and persevere. Be patient. Don't give up. Don't give up. That's all he's asking of you. You don't have to succeed. Remember? You can be blind, and he'll give you glory. But he's not asking anything other than our patience, our perseverance, and our goodwill. The cross is always presented to us in a design of love. God has a design, a giant blueprint, and it's covered with crosses. And the name of that blueprint is love. Everything in that plan is love, but it's all designed with crosses. I had this memory that I had to imagine, because I don't remember falling. I don't remember falling when I played basketball from my concussion. So I, I in my depression, I imagined myself falling, what that would look like. They showed me on the court where I fell. They showed me where the pool of my blood was. It was at the top of the key on the left side when you're facing to the east. Top of the key, and that's where my head hit. And so I, I tried to reconstruct it in my imagination, and in my depression, I would think it over and over and over and over again. Seeing myself catch that basketball, falling backwards on my bottom, slamming my head to the ground. And watching the crack happen and the blood happen, and it just caused me pain. But I just kept bringing it to prayer, I kept thinking about it, and I kept bringing it to Jesus. And then one day when I was at a retreat in Walburga in August, this was before I gave the talk to the sisters, but I was on retreat for myself, this came to me through this book, I Believe in Love. If you haven't read this book, you should read this book. Don't walk, run, and get this book. I read this book three times before my concussion. Three times. And the chapter on the cross never meant anything to me. <coughs> the chapter on the cross meant diddly squat. When I read that chapter, when I was on retreat, that image of me falling backwards, the imagined memory that I created, all of a sudden, I realized God said to me when I was praying about it, it just, took, it just became full of light. I saw myself falling. I saw my head hit the ground. I saw the whiplash. I saw the blood. I saw the black <coughs> And it became full of light. And all it said to me was love, love, love. God is loving you through this. This is a sacrament. I, I hesitate to use that word, but it's almost that strong. This is a sacrament. What is a sacrament? A visible sign of an invisible reality. What is my concussion? A visible sign of an invisible reality. The invisible reality is God's infinite, perfect, tender love for me. And I had that aha moment with the sisters in Walburga one day in the chapel, and I said, oh my God, it's all about love. And I rethought the whole six months, everything, every day for the last six months, I rethought it in one hour, and all the pieces came together, and I was floating in my pew, saying like, why would I not want a concussion? <laughs> because the concussion has now become the greatest avenue of God's love in my life. I have never experienced God's love in that way ever, period. And when I say experienced, I mean experienced. I sensed it. It wasn't like, it wasn't like this. Oh, there's my suffering. There's Jesus. He's consoling me. Thank you for consoling me in my suffering. So that's not what it was. It was, here's my suffering. Where's Jesus? Oh my God, he is the suffering. My suffering is his love. And when that happened, I, it felt sweet. It felt good. It felt easy. For that one moment, for that one hour, when I realized that the cross is always, always a sign of his love. I experienced his tenderness. I experienced his tenderness, his gentleness, and his attentiveness. All of it through that concussion. 
Oh my gosh. So I want to go through some biblical basis of this. Because I think it's really important that we look at the Bible. Especially when it comes to this, this idea. Is this in the Bible? Or is this just Father Ryan having some kind of weird moment in the chapel of the Sisters of Wolver? Okay, let's look at the Bible. Let's do, I'm just going to do a really quick overview of the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark. Gospel of Mark starts out how? This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's how it starts. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You never hear that line for the rest of the gospel until when? Until a centurion is standing looking at Jesus on the crucifix. He's standing facing Jesus on the crucifix. This is the end of the gospel. Standing at the, he looks at Jesus. Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The centurion is watching him. And then it says, Jesus breathed his last. And the centurion looks up and says, that dude's the son of God. You have to be kidding me. How? How can he watch Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And then he breathes his last. And then the centurion says, that guy's the son of God. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. I, I, I saw my grandma die. I saw my grandma die. I saw her breathe her last. And I didn't say she was a daughter. She was the daughter of God. I didn't say that. What's going on? What's going on there? We see Jesus, his heart is spiritually broken when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he breathes his last. The Holy Spirit is associated with the breath. God breathes the Holy Spirit. And what is the Holy Spirit? In the Holy Trinity, what does the Holy Spirit represent? We got the Father, we got the Son, we got the Holy Spirit, which is the? Love. 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 Oh. It is the love of God. And the, whole, and the centurion was standing right there watching Jesus' heart be spiritually broken, spiritually. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he breathes his last Holy Spirit. And he says, this man was the son of God. Because of the love he experienced in the suffering of Jesus Christ, in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now go to the Gospel of John. I'm going to do the same thing. Gospel of John. John begins by saying, we have seen his glory, the glory as of an only begotten son. It's in the prologue of John. Now, have you ever asked yourself, where did John see glory? You ever ask yourself, where did John, in the gospel, where do we see glory? Come on, John, why did you say that? And we don't see it in the gospel. Where is it at? Now, fast forward to Calvary. Who is standing before the cross of Calvary? John, with the mother of Jesus. And a centurion. Same centurion. I bet it's the same centurion. I do. I'll bet money on it. <laughs> what does John see the centurion do? Jesus dying on the cross. And what does the centurion take? A spear, and he stabs Jesus in the heart. And what comes out of that broken heart? Blood and water. Broken heart. Didn't we already talk about a broken heart? Remember? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's not in John. John doesn't have Jesus say that. John has a physical broken heart. Mark has a spiritual broken heart. And out of the broken heart of Christ, what then happens? Then it says, he breathed his last. Again, in John. And then what does John say immediately after that? He says, I can promise you that my testimony is true. And I have seen. That's it. See, he saw. Saw the glory. I have seen the water and blood come out of his sight. And what I promise you is that he is the Son of God. Again, the breath, the love, the broken heart. The love of God is united and part of the broken heart of Jesus Christ. Now, why would it not be a part of the broken heart of his followers? The broken heart of his body, the church on earth. So there's some of the biblical, biblical basis for that last one there. Okay, we're almost done. We're going we're gonna to bring it to the end here. Um, it's really important, too, that we don't forget the resurrection. Okay, we're done talking about these three points here. I hope you get it. The cross is a sign of love. But when we suffer, it's easy to forget about the resurrection. <clears throat> when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God answer him? 
Jesus, the Son of God, said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did God answer him? It was silent. Can you believe that? That is a scandal to me. I'm like, God, what, what the hell were you doing? Your boy was dying, and you didn't do anything. And I lay on my bed of pain in my concussion, and I say, God, what the hell are you doing? Your boy is dying. And I know what Jesus feels. But my cross is a lot smaller. But I can relate. God doesn't say anything. God doesn't say anything. And that doesn't, and he doesn't, and guess what? It doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Silence, crickets. He's like, okay, now you're going to die. And guess what? I'm going to send you to hell, Jesus. Jesus went to hell. It didn't stop there. It got worse. It got worse. God said nothing. God said nothing. So I bet God's probably been pretty quiet during your suffering too, hasn't he? But then when did God speak? When did God speak? On Easter morning. He spoke the words, my son, I love you. And who came back to life? Who rose from the dead? His word of love was descending, was following, was in Jesus all the way through hell and back up to the resurrection. And God said, my word is the last word. I'm going to let Satan say whatever he wants, and he can say it as long as he wants, but I get the last word, because I am God, and I love you. So if you're down, if you've fallen, if you're hurt, say a little prayer, God, raise me up. God, raise me up. When you want, where you want, and how you want. We cannot forget to look for that resurrection, God raising us up. So important. So important. And then I just want to just kind of finish with this last strong, strong word. I propose to you tonight, after all of this, that happiness is impossible without suffering. That is the most contradictory statement you will ever hear in this world. Happiness and suffering are inseparable. Is that what television tells you? No. Nope. No. Nope. Is that what the, sh the stores you go shop at tell you? No. Nope. Is that what your teachers tell you? No. Nope. Is that even what you tell yourself? No. What do we tell ourselves? We say, I'll be happy when I'm comfortable. I'll be happy when I get my way. I'll be happy when I have the food I want. I'll be happy when I'm done with this cancer. I'll be happy when A, B, C, or D is finished, fixed, over, done with. And there's no more suffering in my life, then I'll be happy. That is exactly not true if you believe this. What this means, if this is true, this means you can be happy anywhere all the time. That suffering is no longer an obstacle for you. You don't have to be the kind of person that says, when I'm done with my cancer, I'll be happy. You'd be like, I got cancer. Yes! Oh, man! God loves me! God loves me! God loves me so much, I love my cancer. No, I don't want, I don't want any treatment. No, I just want to suffer. That's why the saints say that. I don't want any treatment because this is an experience of God's love for me. Don't deprive me of it. St. Therese, tuberculosis, she wouldn't take medicine. Tuberculosis is when you choke to death in your own lungs. You know that? You, you, you suffocate in your own lungs. She said, no, I don't want any painkillers because this is God's love for me. You want to deprive me of God's love? And what do people say? Cuckoo. Cuckoo. <laughs> You're crazy. But this is something you can't force yourself. This is only something you can be open to and allow the Lord to lead you into. To receive it. Receive this grace. It's a grace. It's a grace. And, and it's not just me saying this. This isn't just Father Rang saying, like, happiness only comes through suffering. Yay! No, that's not just me. Who else said it? Jesus. Yep, me and Jesus are pretty much the same. <laughs> <laughs> only when I say the prayer of consecration at Mass. <laughs> well, where does Jesus say this? In the Beatitudes. Don't forget about the Beatitudes. They are the stairway to achieving this. What does he say? Blessed are those who weep. People who cry are usually suffering. Yes or yes. Blessed are the poor, right? Go to Puebla, Mexico. Blessed are those poor people. 
Are they suffering? Yeah. They have to live in a one room living room for a bedroom with eight kids. You gotta be kidding me. <coughs> Blessed are those who suffer, is what Jesus says. That's the thing. That's the thing. If you could boil it all down, you're persecuted, you're suffering. All of the all of the beatitudes come down to one. Blessed are those who suffer. Blessed. You know what another word for blessed is? I like this word better. Lucky. You are friggin' lucky, man. You, you are poor. You're so lucky. Why? Because you have a better access to God's love than people who got it comfy. Right? You had a concussion, Father Ryan, severe traumatic brain injury? Lucky. So lucky. Because people who don't have traumatic brain injuries, they're probably not experiencing this. They're probably stuck up here. Or they're down here, right? This is what is so radical about the the. the the words of Jesus. And I just want to read something from this book, just so you can get a little taste, a little taste test, a little sample. It's like we're at Sam's Club or Costco. Here, come try this over here. Okay. <laughs> the wisdom of the world is exactly opposed to the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Jesus says, blessed are the pure. The world says, blessed are they who indulge in loose living. Jesus says, blessed are those who weep. The world says, blessed are those who laugh and amuse themselves. Jesus says, blessed are the meek, the merciful. The world says, blessed are those who impose themselves on others and dominate them. Jesus says, blessed are the poor. The world says, blessed are the rich. Jesus says, blessed are those who suffer. The world says, blessed are those who enjoy themselves. Is this hard to live? Yeah, it is. Is it worth living? I think so. I think so. And even if you guys don't want to join me, I'm really happy right now. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep living this life that God has given me through this concussion and through my, my all my crosses. And we're going to finish with what St. Paul says, and I've already said it. What can separate us from the love of Christ? If this is true, if this is true, what can separate you from the love of Christ? Your cancer can. Your divorce can. Getting fired from work cannot. Having a miscarriage cannot. Becoming a bad priest cannot separate you from the love of Christ. Having a concussion, whatever it is, being paralyzed from the waist down, getting dementia, anything, whatever it is, being poor, going into debt, nothing. If we bring it to Jesus, if we see it with the eyes of faith, can separate us from the love of Christ. In the, name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you and I praise you and I bless you for your mercy and your love. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for my brothers and sisters gathered here. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for my concussion. Thank you for all the suffering of my life, Jesus. Thank you for bringing good out of bad. Thank you for always loving us in everything. Thank you for breaking down all the limits. Thank you for breaking down all the restrictions. And we ask that you would increase our faith, Jesus. I believe, Lord, help my own belief. Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to really pray, especially when we're sad, when we're broken, when we're hurting, when we're lonely. Give us real prayer, Lord, so that we can experience your love in our suffering and our pain. I pray that for each one of my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that they would experience the sweetness of your love through the reality of their pain. That you would show yourself to them, that you would touch them and love them like they've never been loved before. And Lord, help us to love the cross. Every time we look at the crucifix, help us to realize what a great, great sign that is. And Jesus, I lay down my life for the cross. Lord Jesus, I offer my entire life to you for that sign, for that cross. And I thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you, Mother Mary, for your courage to stand at the foot of the cross, to not run away from the cross, to not reject the cross. Thank you, Mother Mary, for giving us an example of true courage, true strength, true strength, more manly than any man, more persevering than any athlete, more powerful than any other human being alive, Blessed Virgin Mary to stand at the foot of that cross and to see the love of God in your Son, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be, 
for and without end. Amen. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Questions, comments? Not bad. Only an hour and five minutes. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, question right there. I think it'd be nice if you gave, uh, gave your testimony on those lighthouse things. You think so? <laughs> uh, don't flatter my ego. <laughs> yeah, I'll think about it. I recorded it. Maybe I'll just send it to him and say, you guys need this. <laughs> Thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, questions coming? Well, uh, it seemed one of the things I thought about was, on this was uh, recently, as you, as you talked about the world, Contrast with what Jesus teaches. Yeah. Uh, it's recently passed um, uh, euthanasia mm-hmm. in the course of the people of health. This one that you have in Yeah, what's your name? David Fry. David. So David said recently the you know the euthanasia law was passed in Colorado, and that seems like a suffering across, you know, um, death. And he just said, he asked if I had any insights or any comments about that. Uh, I think as Catholic Christians, we are experiencing that as another cross. We experience that as another cross. And whatever negative effects come into our lives because of that is a sign of God's love for us. Now, does that mean God wanted euthanasia? No. But God didn't want me to have a concussion either. You see the point. The point is that God allows evil so that we can be free to choose to love him in response to that evil. But behind that evil, which is where I'm asking us to go, behind that evil is love. That God is even even manipulating that bad law to show his love for us who have to suffer that. He didn't want that law, but it's there. God didn't want that concussion, but it's there. And so he'll hijack it, and he will even allow us to experience his love for us through that suffering caused by that law. Same with abortion, same with any other unjust law. He doesn't want it. He never wants it. I'm glad you brought that up. God never wants you to suffer. I didn't say that. But God doesn't want you to suffer. He didn't create you to suffer. But because of the broken world we live in, suffering happens. And now he's undone it. He's gone into it, like I said, the pits of hell, and he came out alive. He's gone into that euthanasia, and he's using it now to show us his love for us. Now, does he want it to end? Yeah. Does he want my concussion to end? Yeah. Am I no longer going to experience his love through my concussion? Yep. No more love through that concussion, except through my memories, right? But that's also a different experience, because he's talking about a social experience, where I was talking about individual, personal experiences. That My whole talk was focused on individual, personal experiences. So what is this going to feel like for us to experience euthanasia as a church? You may not experience God's love, I mean, because it's going to be a church effort. It's not going to be a personal effort unless someone in your family experiences euthanasia. And then even that is a sign of God's love. Yeah, no problem. I never ask questions, but I just thought you did you experience the um, concussion after you became a father. I did. And it, yeah. the fact that you didn't experience that prior to, I just want to understand your calling. And kind of, My calling? Yeah, and like you, you didn't experience that kind of oneness with Christ. No. But, was it different or my so what was your name? Laura. Laura asked, uh, you experienced this concussion after your calling to the priesthood. I said, yes, that's true. Uh, I didn't experience this kind of love until I was already a priest for five years. Um, so she said, well, what about your calling? You, know, you didn't experience that kind of love beforehand. Okay, so yes, I did experience God's love beforehand, but never through the cross. Never, never consciously through the cross. Like I suffered crosses through my life, and I think God was loving me through those crosses. But I didn't consciously say, wow, God's loving me right now in my pain. Not until that concussion. But of course, yeah, I had experiences in prayer of his beauty, especially his beauty. The beauty of God has been very uh, positively manifest to me in prayer. 
Um, and I've, I've seen, I've experienced a lot of things that are very beautiful and super attractive. So God has always been drawing me to himself. And when I got close enough, then he laid the cross on me. And I'm like, oh, wow, wow, here we go. Does that make sense? At least that's kind of how I see it. He was using other things to draw me in, and then the cross came in, and it was after I'd been a priest for five years. Thanks. I don't know if it's a cultural thing, but one of the things I experienced, you know, growing up was a lot of, my, my grandmother was bedridden for many years with arthritis, suffered intensely, yeah. and there were numerous members in the family, and particularly my mother, who always wondered, what did she do to deserve this and be right. punished? And I find that I get myself stuck on some of that kind of thinking mm -hmm. with things that have happened you know, in my life. And there's got to be a process to get yourself out of that and go into the other stages to where. And do you have any insight? There How is, to to yeah. There? No, there is a process. I don't know if I can lay it out for you like a blueprint or a map, but there is a process. And I think vulnerability, grieving, so being honest about what you feel and being honest about what you feel with the Lord. And that means even saying, Jesus, I hate you. Jesus, I really hate you. I mean, I would lay on my bed, and I would say that to him. I say, I, I say, God, you don't love me, or else why would I have this? You know, why would this be happening to me? That's where you need to start. You need to start in those painful, difficult, bad feelings that you have towards God or towards anybody. I don't care who it is. It could be towards your dad, your mom, your brother, but you need to tell God about it. And that's where you start. And then the grieving process begins letting go of the way you wanted things to be. That's the other big step. You acknowledge the painful feelings where you're at, stuck, I'm stuck in this. And then you say, this is the way I wanted things to be, and it's not going to be that way. And I hate that. And I'm sad, and I'm just going to cry and cry. I cried a lot with my concussion. I had never cried so much in my entire life. And then my, my, suit, my pillow was like soaking wet, which is really embarrassing, because my life wasn't what I wanted it to be. This is not the kind of priest Father Ryan was supposed to be. Father Ryan was supposed to be heroic and good and handsome, right? No, it wasn't working. It wasn't working. And so what did I have to do? I had to grieve the fact that I was not the priest I wanted to be. But I was the priest Jesus wanted me to be. So that's, I think those are two first steps. Acknowledging and being very vulnerable and vocal with those negative feelings and then being allowed, giving yourself permission to just acknowledge what you don't have that you wish you had, that you think you deserve. Whatever it is, I deserve no arthritis. I deserve happiness in my life. I deserve a good life. And then grieving through that and allowing yourself to move through that, then, then you start to see, okay, it's not about punishment. It's not about punishment. What's going on here? What's God's plan? Then you start to think, okay, there are some things in myself that need to be purified. I wanted to have no arthritis because I want to have a great basketball career. But God doesn't want that. So God's like, okay, now I'm going to purify that, which is another level, which means bring it to him. I want a great basketball career. I want a great basketball career. I want a great basketball Keep letting it go. Keep giving it to him. And he will purify it through the suffering. And then when you come to the point where you're ready to let that go and you're ready to let his honor and his glory to become really what your life is about, as a basketball player or whatever it is, then he says, love. Now you understand what this is all about. And sometimes I don't think it's always sensible. I wish it was. But what I experienced, I don't think I can expect everyone in the room to experience. I can hope for it. I can pray for it. I can wish it. But I just, I'm just too far along in my spiritual life to realize that what I've experienced in my spiritual life, everybody experiences in their spiritual life. It's not true. It's not true. Padre Pio had stigmata. I mean, there's only been like four people in the Asian world with stigmata. Right? But does that mean that we don't also carry the wounds of Christ in our body? We do. It just doesn't look like Padre Pio. Now, I've experienced God's love through my pain in a very significant way. Does that mean you're going to experience it just like I did? No, but it means you will experience it. He will give you a taste of his love when and where and how he wants you to. It may be a flower growing in your garden someday. You'll be like, oh, God loves me. You know, like that's it's going to be different than me sitting in a chapel and feeling the sweetness of God's love through my pain. Right? But he will give it to you. It just won't look exactly like it did for me. Okay? So that's why I can't give you a blueprint. I can't give you a map. I can just give you these guideposts of what it looked like for me in my spiritual life. Yeah. 
Oh, uh, yes, in that big one. Could you tell me why the church put so much emphasis on to become a saint, you have to have two miracles? I always make it a joke when I pray for somebody. I said, you know, I mean, I've just got to get this miracle. I, I know. Never feel, I'm with that's you. That's my attitude yeah. that I pray for somebody. I need two miracles. But, I mean, why does the church put such emphasis? How many of us in this room have two miracles to our name? It's a great question. She says, why does the church put so much mir uh, emphasis on miracles? Well, that's a good question. The church does not put emphasis on miracles during your lifetime. You do not have to do any miracles while you're alive. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You do have to do two miracles after you're dead. <laughs> two miracles after you're dead. To prove to us that you are where we hope you are. Because if you're in heaven, you can do miracles. It's a lot easier there than it is here. <laughs> so I'm going to take a little pressure off you. No miracles necessary. Uh, just keep following the Lord Jesus. Just keep you know, carrying your cross and loving him, you know, the way he asks you to love him. And then let the Holy Spirit do the rest. You know, because God only wants certain guys and certain gals to be saints that are canonized. But he wants millions and billions of us to be saints in heaven who are unknown and uncanonized. I see it as a vocation. I see being a canonized saint as a vocation. If you're not called to it, forget about it. If you're not called to be a canonized saint, do not worry about it. And you don't know you're called to be a canonized saint until you die. <laughs> you can't know that before you're dead. So it's one of those vocations. It's kind of tricky. You know what I mean? It's one of those tricky vocations. You've got to wait till you're dead. You'd be like, whoa, this has been my vocation all along. Hello, Pope, canonize me. <laughs> but for the rest of us, we just got to slap along and hope that we can cooperate with the grace that's given to us to make it to where God wants us to be. He's got a place for you in heaven right now. I can see it. I can see it. Mine, mine's right there, you know, next to St. Therese. I'm, I'm her chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I had a question in the back there first, yeah? Oh, um, I just wondered if you had any advice as to how to walk with someone who's suffering, maybe mm. someone on a faith line especially, and just like sure. allow them to have the love of God through that suffering. Sure, good question. So she said, how do you walk with somebody who's suffering? Uh, especially if they don't have a faith life. You know, maybe they don't have faith in Jesus or God. Or they do, but it's very basic and not very good. The number one word for us in Latin is compassion, compassio, and in Greek is empathia, empathy. They mean the same thing, to suffer with, to suffer with the person. To suffer calm is with passion to suffer. You know, pathos, suffering, M, to enter into the pathos of another. So the best thing we can do is to go into our own experience of suffering and to be with that person via our own experience of suffering. So for example, when I, after I had my concussion, I went up to my, home, my old parish in Granby. And one of my beloved parishioners, he's a Mexican immigrant, his name is Jorge, he had a severe, severe stroke. And his whole right side of his body was paralyzed. Now, he actually didn't come to Mass every week, but I loved him. And he's a good man. His children did, but he didn't. And his whole right side was paralyzed, and I saw him with a crutch, and his, you know, his whole face was sagging, and he could only talk off the left side. And he's only 50 years old. I mean, come on, he's practically a baby. And I see him, and I, I just, as soon as I see him, where do I go? I am fresh off this traumatic brain injury, and I go immediately into my heart thinking, I fell. I fell, and God has abandoned me, and I am not lovable, and my life is a mess, you know? And I, and I go there, and as I embrace Jorge, I am crying. And he hasn't even said anything to me yet. He hasn't even told me what's wrong. I could just see his suffering, and I enter into my own suffering, and he felt so loved. He started crying. I was crying. These two grown men are crying, <laughs> holding each other. And, and then he just said with a half, you know, half mouth in Spanish, he said, Father, just give me your blessing. And I said, Jorge, I already have. But I'll give you another one. <laughs> you know? And my blessing was just to enter into my heart where I'm suffering so that I could be with him in his suffering. Because we have this weird idea that I can somehow enter into his suffering. I can't. I actually cannot enter into Jorge's suffering. That's, that's not possible. Because I've never had a stroke, I've never been married, I've never had four children, and I'm not Mexican. <laughs> right? So for us to sit here and think, oh, all you have to do is enter into their suffering, that's baloney. It doesn't work. 
<laughs> what you have to do is you have to open up your heart and go to that place that hurts. And that's why we don't do it. That's why we're not compassionate. Because that means I have to enter into my suffering so I can walk with him in his suffering. That's why it's hard to be a mentor in the cruciform discipleship. Because it means you enter into your suffering over and over and over again in order to walk with your disciples in their suffering. And that is hard. Unless you experience your suffering as love. And then it's really easy to go back into your heart where you had your concussion, where you were rejected by your family, where you were fired, where you were homeless, where you were drug addicted. To go there. And whether this guy struggles with drugs or not, it doesn't matter. You did. You go there and you walk with your friend who's going through a divorce, even though you've never been through a divorce. And they feel the love. I know they do. And that's real. And then when you bless them, when you pray with them, it actually means something. It actually means something. Now, does it always work the way I shared with you? No. But that's what we need to attempt to do. We need to attempt to do that. That's real compassion. That's real empathy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes? Um, I think a lot of times it is for me, it's easier to feel like all this and see the Lord in suffering when you look back on it after yeah. it's done. Um, and see the yourself to Christ after it's done, so after suffering. Do you know how many times this or to make it stick so in the midst of it you can hear yourself to Him yeah. and pull ourselves out of it? Perfect. So she said, a lot of times I can experience this kind of progression after the fact. So I go through something bad, I look back and say, oh, God was loving me in that. But she says, how can I experience that in the moment? Is there anything we can do to kind of experience that in the moment? And I would say, begin doing this with little crosses in your life. When things don't go the way you want them to while you're driving to work. <laughs> it's a simple little prayer that I've begun to pray since I've had this experience. It's a simple little prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this cross. I accept this cross as a sign of your love for me. And I begin to train my mind and train my heart to think the way Jesus wants me to think and to feel the way Jesus wants me to feel. Because you have to train yourself. Because we trained ourselves to think, cross, man, <laughs> cross, get away, it hurts. That's what we train ourselves to do. So you have to train yourself with little crosses to do the same thing, the opposite way. Say, Jesus, thank you for this cross. I accept this cross as a sign of your love for me. Simple, that's it. You may experience something in that moment. You may not. But try to, try to surrender to the Lord in that moment. Try to open your spirit to him and see if he wants to give you any consolation, any love when you say that little prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for this traffic jam. I accept this traffic jam as a sign of your love for me. And this has really helped me with my arthritis in my neck every day. When I feel that, I say, Jesus, thank you for this pain in my neck. I accept this cross as a sign of your love for me. Now, does it always take the pain away? No, but remember my point? The point is that it doesn't take the pain away, it's that the pain becomes a sign of his love. That's the crazy part that we can't get our minds around. He's not going to take the pain away, but the pain becomes an avenue, a conduit of his love. The traffic jam is not going to go away. But with faith, the traffic jam becomes a, a source of consolation that Jesus has given me this traffic jam as a particular sign of his love for me today. It's like, it's like a bouquet of flowers. Oh my God, he got me a traffic jam! You know, like, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is. Okay? So, taking those little acts, those little crosses, and then when the big one hits, then you know what to do. Thank you, Jesus, for this cross. I accept this cross as a sign of your love for me. And then you can make it to this experience much quicker. Yes? I just wanted to point out, I have had you at our, as a priest in Grandview several oh, times before yeah. the accident, and then I think right after the accident, and mm -hmm. you've always been this charismatic, so people who are wondering if the experience made you more charismatic, maybe, maybe it was special, because you communicate this very well, um, but you have always been this charismatic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, I know. I think I think I have you know a certain personality type that is charismatic on a natural level. But what I think is going on is God is just adding grace upon grace to my natural personality. Yeah. So now I can say things and feel things and and express things in a way that's much deeper than I could before. Like before, I was just kind of a comedian, and I, I, I could I could get the message across, but I didn't quite experience it in my heart. And now when I tell you something, I'm actually experiencing it. If you couldn't tell tonight, I was experiencing a lot of what I was sharing with you tonight. 
Whereas before, it was mostly head knowledge. Like, I know this to be true, therefore I'll make it funny and you'll like it, or whatever, you know? <laughs> now, now I'm like, I know this to be true because I've experienced it, you know? So that's, that's kind of, thank you for that. Yep. Question. Yes. Yes. Here first. Okay. 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 So, my question is: When you say give it to to Jesus, yeah, I am hard time figuring how to wait. When you say just give it to them, how do you do that? You don't. You don't give him anything. You let go of it. How do you do that? That's a good question. (laughs) (laughs) When people ask me how do you surrender, because when you think of giving it, you're still in control. The issue is that we're in control. That's the issue. And as soon as we're not in control, things start to go much better interiorly. So when you say, how do I give it to him? That's where I also be like, I can't give it to him because then you're still in control. Because you're deciding to give it to him. But if you say, I want to surrender this to you, Jesus. Well, that's really difficult because it's like you've been doing this your whole life, right? You've been grabbing things, controlling things, making things the way you want them to be. Holding on the wheel, and we're going the way I want to go, right? Which is fine, because you got to make decisions, you got to live your life. But in the spiritual life, that does not work at all. And you'll reach a certain point in your life when you're like, uh, why is my spiritual life totally boring and not working? Well, because you're still holding the wheel, right? You're still grabbing. So look at your spiritual muscle. This is what you're doing. Grab, grab, grab. For how long? 20, 30, 40 years? Whoa, you have some amazing forearms. Like, those (laughs) muscles in your forearm are incredibly strong because you've been doing this and trying to make things work and fix things and tell God what he should be doing and not really doing this. Your muscles are not trained to do this spiritually. This is why St. Ignatius of Loyola talks about spiritual exercises because you're doing this and you need to be doing this let go, surrender, surrender. So if you say to me, I don't know how to do that, Father, well, that's because your muscles are way too strong in this direction. And for you to begin to do this, it's going to be really hard. You'll be like, ugh, ugh, ugh. but you just have to try doing it. It's like, it's like, it's like someone comes up to me because I, I've practiced this for a long time. And St. Therese was the one who really taught me how to surrender. And it's a grace that I, was, that I received. So for me, it's like someone coming up to me and saying, it's like a baby coming up to me and saying, like, Father Ryan, tell me how I should walk. A baby? How do you tell a baby to walk? How? How do you, literally, mom and dad, how do you tell babies to walk? Son, take your right leg, lift the knee forward, and then flex the ankle, boy, and then put the, the heel down first, and then follow with the toe. You're going to want to shoot your weight forward, because if you lean forward too back, you're not going to make it. But don't go too far forward, lift the right knee soon enough so that you can counter your balance. You, you don't do that. You don't do that with baby. What do you do with the baby? You're like, stand up, son, get going, boy. Come on, get going. Spend the line bottom and just watch him go, you know what I mean? Right? Get to mommy, come on, get to mommy. Is he going to make it the first time? Is he going to make it the second time? No. It's going to take him a long time to learn how to walk. It's going to take us a long time to learn how to do this. A lot of times it feels like we're letting go into the void. Oh, and I'm losing control. And losing control is a bad feeling for a lot of people. But God wants you to be in that space where you're not in control and you can feel fine. You can feel comfortable. You can feel peaceful. It's like, we are in a we are in a handbasket to hell and I feel great. You know what I mean? But I, I don't need I don't need to grab on to anything because who's my savior, who's my Lord, who's in control? Jesus Christ. And I'm gonna keep my hands wide open, which is why charismatic people oftentimes try to get non-charismatic people to do this when they're praying. Why? Because it's a physical reality that your soul needs to experience. And for some people, they don't like praying like this. I feel exposed. I feel vulnerable. I feel like I'm not in control. Exactly. Exactly. That's what we all need to come to in here. Now, do you need to do this to experience that? No, you don't. But that's why charismatic people do that. Because they see that as a sign of what should be going on in here. And we don't. Sometimes you can do this and still be like this in your heart. You know what I mean? So in your heart, there needs to be what, what, and what is it? What is it you're obsessed about? You know what it is. It's the thought that keeps going over and over and over again. That's the one thing that Jesus is like, can you just let go? Can you just let go of that? <clears throat> if you do that, then you are making huge strides. Huge strides. Whether it's school, or work, or family, or spouse, or children, or whatever. Or health. 
let go. Let go of your health. You're gonna, you're gonna get sick and you're gonna die whether you're controlling or not. So you want Jesus in control or not? That's the big question. So if you're a baby, I'm just gonna pick you up and say, go, go, I surrender, <laughs> surrender, just do it. And you guys gonna have to say, okay, I surrender. And then try it. Or I release it. Or I let it go. Or whatever works for you. Right? Whatever works for you. Or just go like this. I don't know. But you gotta practice. You can use your imagination. I have a friend who used to imagine the, the problem as a tennis ball. And he'd take the tennis ball and he would try to let go of the tennis ball and it'd fall into Jesus' hand. He'd be like, done. In his imagination, he surrendered the tennis ball and he like, I did it. I surrendered by letting go of the tennis ball. So whatever works, works. You know, you just gotta experiment, you gotta play, you gotta be open to it. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. I can't. The Holy Spirit can't. Good question. Well, it's a picture of babies. Yeah. That's right. Babies do that, right? <laughs> Sometimes they got chubby little fists, too. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, babies got their hands up because they're going to fall. <laughs> good. Yes, you want to mention it? Okay, for example, I've been here for a while, but I was sick five days before Christmas, and I couldn't realize that God gave me rest and that it was his love. I couldn't, only I pray sure. God take away this, sure. this that I'm sick. Sure. You see, at this moment I cannot right. take, I think, no, it cannot be, right. I cannot stand up. Sure. I only pray, so right. it can be also like this. That's right. You pray Very God right. take away, yeah. take away this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so she said she was sick for five days before Christmas, and it was so much pain, she couldn't stand up, and all she could pray was, God, heal me, God, take yeah. this away. And she wasn't sitting there being like, oh, I'm in bliss, this is amazing, you know, it wasn't that, that's fine, that's fine, it's okay that you were where you're at, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's it, that's another good, important point, we should ask God to heal us. It's okay to ask God to heal you, please. Don't take this as, you should suffer and like it. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying... You should be open if God does not heal you. If he wants you to be sick for five days and you pray, God, heal me, God, heal me, God, heal me. Okay, then you don't need to let do with that prayer. God, heal me, God, heal me, God, heal me, God, heal me, God, heal me. Okay, okay, God, okay. I've already asked you to heal me. I'm going to let go. I'm going to let go of that prayer. Because once you say it once, he heard you. Now I'm going to start going through this and say, okay, God, you're not healing me. I accept this cross as a sign of your love for me. And I thank you for that. But if you want to heal me, I'm still open. That. <laughs> That's a totally legitimate prayer. Totally legitimate. Totally legitimate. Nothing wrong with that. Don't beat yourself up for wanting to be healthy. God wants you to be healthy. God wants you to be healthy. He doesn't want there to be euthanasia. He doesn't want there to be suffering. But there is. And so he can sometimes heal you if he wants. But what I'm trying to help you realize is that sometimes it's okay to not be healed. That if God doesn't heal you, it's, a, it's not that he hates you. Because sometimes we think that. God's not healing me of my cancer. He must not love me. That's what we think. Don't lie to me because I think the same thing. What I'm telling you here is if God doesn't heal you from your cancer, it doesn't mean he doesn't love you. It means he actually does love you. It's really hard. But that's the truth that I'm getting at. Does that make sense? I, I've had several uh, very close people in my life that have had cancer, yeah. and I notice, um, and, and this has really helped. I've noticed when they found out, I was shocked to see how their reaction was, because I don't know how I would handle it. And I, right now, I'd probably be angry, mm -hmm. but they they were not. Mm -hmm. They accepted it, and I don't know if anybody else has experienced that, but with all of this, it, it makes a lot of sense that yeah. they just let go and said, this is what is going to happen to me, right. and that is really hard. It is, but you bring up another really good point. Anticipation of suffering is worse than suffering itself. Uh, yeah. That's what I experienced. Fear of something bad happening to me is almost worse than the actual bad thing that happens to me. I mean, Mark Twain said, I've had a lot of bad things happen to me in my life, and some of them actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
right? That's because we get stuck up here and we're so rooted for fear. That's the killer. The fear is what causes so much pain. And so if you can identify the fear in yourself, that's another thing to let go of. Why am I holding on to this fear? I'm not sick. I don't have cancer. What am I afraid of? Am I afraid that God's not going to love me? Baloney. He loves me no matter what. So I can let go of this fear. And I don't have to have that stress or the anxiety that comes from the fear. I don't have to worry about bad things happening to me because when a bad thing happens to me, guess what? I know it's a good thing. Even if the doctor doesn't think so. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. So I wanted to thank you first for uh, raising <laughs> this point about how crosses are a sign of God's love. Yeah. I, uh, even uh, even today, I, I had found myself wondering what, what crosses has God ever given me. And one of your first examples was broken relationships. I look at that in my own life, my younger life, and uh, I had two broken relationships. And uh, I know both of them would have turned into really bad marriages. I can see that now. And uh, had I gone with either one of those, uh, I never would have met my wife. And, uh, um, she was a cradle Catholic, I'm a convert. I never never would have become Catholic and never would have had a family. Yeah. And so it was really a blessing. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. <coughs> yeah, the cross doesn't always have to be physical pain, right? Cross can the cross can be the anxiety of being afraid of getting cancer. That could be a cross. You have anxiety. Maybe you have panic attacks, right? That could be your cross. Does it mean God doesn't love you? No. It means that God is loving you through that. Yeah, Danielle. Um, so I can probably speak for a few of us in here about like if we're searching for our vocation. Now that can be a very that can be a cross, and I I'm sure you've experienced this, but I mean it can be a very a repeatable thought. I guess, and I know like the, um, you know, letting it go, but right. I guess what are ways that we can help, like, pursue, pursue that vocation, like, in, see, does that make sense? It does, yeah, so Daniel's asking, you know, for those of us who are, are discern, discerning our vocation or concerned about our vocation, we don't yet, or we're not married, we're not in religious life, whatever it is, we're open to that, we want to figure that out. But how do we do that kind of along some of these principles, seeing God's love? Because it can be a cross to not know your vocation. It can be a cross, and I, I agree, it can be a cross. So can you see the fact that God loves you by the fact that he, that he has not revealed your vocation to you yet, or you have not figured it out yet? Can you come to that point? Can you come to the point that the fact I'm not married, the fact I'm not a priest, the fact that I'm not a religious, you know, for whatever reason... Because I'm thick-headed or hard-hearted, or because I don't know how to pray, it's hard. I want it. I want it. I want it. And she said, "Well, you need to let go. You need to let go of that." Or is there is there some way that God is trying to love me through this? And I think the easiest way for me to say that is God just wants you to love Him for Him first. And so God might might not be giving you an answer because He wants you to experience this first. And, and even the, through even the cross of not having your vocation, and saying like, can you just let me love you even through this frustration of not knowing your vocation? Or are you going to be so attached, so obsessed with the fact that you don't have your vocation that you're not going to experience my love? So let go of that obsession, let go of that attachment as best you can. And the other thing too with that, a lot of, a lot of young people I've worked with in discernment, because I'm the vocation director, I think God is purifying us through the fact that we want our vocation and he's not giving it to us. Because a lot of times we, we want our vocation because I want to be a dad. I want to be a mom. Mm -hmm. Because I want to have a happy family life. Because I want children. Because I want to be a provider and protect my family. Okay, those are all really good reasons, but guess what? Is that the honor and glory of God? Not necessarily. So God might say, let's purify that a little bit. Let's purify that a little bit. Does that hurt? Yeah. But is he doing it out of love? Yes, he's doing it out of love. The other thing that I've noticed, especially with some of the young adult women in Denver, 
is that they have really good ideals, and I don't want them to lower those ideals. But I do want those young women to realize if you're going to maintain those ideals around marriage and dating, in the world we live in, you may not experience the vocation you want, and that ideal might actually be the cross that Jesus wants you to carry. God might want you to suffer the fact that you'll never be married because of the ideals he wants you to maintain in your heart. Because of the truth that he's placed in your heart and because of the men and the society we live in, you may never be married and that's a cross that he's asking you to carry. Out of punishment? No. Out of love. Because he loves you. So, it's just been my experience. I don't know if that helps. Probably makes things worse. But... <laughs> But yeah, it's just helpful to, to just realize there's a lot more going on here than an answer to your prayer. A lot more going on than just what you want answered in prayer. Okay, it's 8, it's 8, it's 8.45. Uh, that's the end. Uh, so I'll give you a blessing and we can officially close. If you want to talk to me, come on up, say hi, uh, and then uh, be free to go. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.